Oh, praise Thank the you. Lord, everybody. God bless you all. Welcome to the Global Network of Kingdom Ambassadors. I am Apostle Mike Cotto, and we are continuing our journey in the beta statement. So I pray that this series so far has been eye-opening and has revealed some, some amazing truth about offense. Because as we learned from the beginning, offense will happen. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what title you hold, how anointed you are, offense will come. Jesus himself said, offense will come. But woe to the one who remains offended, right? So let's get right into this installment, which I entitled, My Father, My Father. And in this installment, we are going to deal with... um. We're going to deal with offenses and hurts that come from a leader or spiritual father or a father figure, right? Because as we learn, the closer the relationship, the greater the impact of the offense is, right? So we're last week we dealt with the, the offense between brothers. Now we're going to deal with offenses between father, son, father, daughter, right? Spiritual father included, leader. These people that hold what? A level of authority over our lives, who God ordained as an authority figure over our lives, right? So let's pray and let's get right into it. Father in heaven, we just thank you. We give you praise. We thank you for another opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that... We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to break open your word. So, Father, I ask, Lord God, that allow us to decrease and you increase, Lord God. Let our hearts, minds, spirit, and soul be receptive to what you would say today, Lord God. Father, we, we give you permission to probe us deeply, Lord God, to see if there's any hurtful ways in us and to lead us in the way everlasting, Lord God. Father, reveal any offense that resides in us so that we may be we may forgive and be released in the mighty name of Jesus, that we may walk in freedom according to your will and your way. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God, everybody. So go with me in your Bible to, to 1 Samuel. Chapter 24, 1 Samuel, chapter 24, verses 10 to 12. And it reads, Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hand. I have not sinned against you, though you hunted my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, for my hand shall not be against you. Praise God. So what we're talking about today is what? Hurt between father and son and daughter or spiritual father, leader, an authority figure that's close to you, right? We're going to be talking about that today. And we're going to use as the backdrop the story of King Saul and David, right? The story of King Saul and David. I'm going to use that as the backdrop, right? So let me ask you a question, right? And, and this is a question for intro to that you should keep in the front of your mind. Have you ever been wronged or hurt by an authority figure in your life? Be it your father, be it be it a a a manager or supervisor on a job, be it a pastor or a leader, right? One of the one of the major things that happens within the body of Christ is called church hurt. It's when, it's when members get hurt by a leader in some way, shape, or form, wronged by a leader, 
right? We see so yeah. many scandals in the body of Christ, right? That happen when 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 leaders who we who we do trust um find themselves in indiscretions that harm not only the body but a specific individual, right? We've seen sexual scandals, right? We've seen just recently here in America, there was a pastor that defrauded their members and he just was arrested and thrown into prison. He was defrauding them out of monies and he was living a lavish lifestyle and he ended up. So so those people that have been defrauded, right? They may have a different idea or a different feeling about leaders and about church. It impacts them in such a way that they are it is hard for them to be able to trust someone else, right? And they they put these walls of protection around them. Or they develop opinions that all pastors are wrong, all leaders are wrong, and they don't draw close to anyone in leadership, right? So this is that's the that's the devastation of that kind of offense because these are people that you trust the most. And oftentimes you trust with the condition of your soul and your life, right? So as we mentioned before, the, great, the, the, the greater the relationship, the greater the offense or the impact of the offense, right? So I'm going to deal with a situation regarding rejection from a father figure or an authority figure. When I speak of fathers, I am not just referring to a biological father, but to any leader God puts over us. These are the people we thought would love, train, nurture, and care for us. So as a backdrop, I'm going to be using the story of King Saul and David. It, 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 it so illustrates, number one, the impact of that sort of offense or abuse, right? That can happen between a leader and, and and the one that he's leading, the the close one that he's training, mentoring, and leading, right? We see in the story of Saul and David two different postures, two different ways that the offense was handled. So we're going to compare and contrast those as well. How Saul handled being offended, as in contrast to how David handled. Right? So number one, Saul was anointed to be the first king of Israel. However, he was disqualified due to his disobedience to God's command and instruction. Right? So, so Saul was king, anointed by God to be king. But however, right, the king was subject to God. Right? Israel is God's people. And, 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 and Samuel, the prophet, was what? Saul's prophet. So, so Samuel will bring the instructions of the Lord, and then Saul, the king, is to carry it out. So there were two occasions where he was disobedient, right? One was they, he, he went to a battle, and they won the battle. And after the battle was won, he was supposed to what? Wait for Samuel to come so they can offer the offering before the Lord, right? Because Samuel was a judge and a priest, and he was the one that administered the offerings at that time, right? So what happened was he was supposed to come in seven days. So the seven days came and went, and Samuel was tarrying, and the people started to get restless. And they wanted to leave. And as they were starting to leave, Saul took it upon himself to offer the offering, right? Which he was not authorized to do. At that moment, Samuel came, right? So now Samuel brings the word of the Lord and says that you, because of your disobedience, is now disqualified. God has chosen another, a man after his own heart. The second time was there was a battle. God instructed him to destroy the Amalekites, right? And the Amalekites, right, there's history with the Amalekites because back in the time of the wilderness and Egypt, 
that time, um, they 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 did not treat the Israelites with kindness when they were passing through their land. And so, how many of you know that God will avenge? Vengeance belongs to the Lord. So the Lord instructed Saul to take out the Amalekites, man, woman, and child, to, to devote it all to destruction. So now Saul goes to the battle, and he wins the victory. But however, he takes the spoil, right? He takes the choicest animals. He saves the king of lies and imprisons the king, right? So now they are celebrating, they're rejoicing on the great victory. So here comes the prophet. Here comes Samuel. And Samuel comes to get the report. And now Saul says, oh, yes, we carried out the command of the Lord, man. We won a great victory. But in the background, he's hearing sheep and animals making noise. He said, but what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? Did you really follow the command of the law? He said, no, we, we, we kept back, the, the people kept back the, 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 the best animals so we could sacrifice it to the Lord your God. And then he said, see, we got the king. We captured him, right? And, and, and then Samuel said, you have disobeyed God. You have not carried out the command of the law, right? So you have been disqualified. Right? So, 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 so what? Samuel had the king brought and he killed the king according to God's command. And then what happened? He destroyed all the sheep and the animals and he carried out God's plan. Right? Because how many of you know when you're disobedient, struggle ensues? It reminds me of the sin of Achan in the book of Joshua. Right? They, 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 they took Jericho in the first battle. And the entire land was devoted to destruction. But Achan took a little bit of the spoil and hid it in his tent. So when they went up to the next battle, they were not able to defeat a smaller, weaker nation than Jericho. And, and it was perplexing to Joshua. He began to cry out to the Lord. And the Lord said, stop crying out to me. Israel has sinned. And it's because of his sin that the people of God could not get victory. So... Joshua had to expose the sin and had to judge the sin and to destroy the devoted thing so they can get victory again. This is a similar situation, right? Because our disobedience can cause us to live a life of defeat. And it also impacts those that are connected to us. This is how big that is. So, so, so now... The Lord takes the kingdom away. He withdraws from him. The spirit of the Lord comes off of him. The anointing comes off of him, right? And now Saul is in a place of distress. He's still king. He's still in his position, but he's not the same because the Lord has left him. The glory of the Lord left him. The favor of God left him, right? In contrast, David was also anointed as Saul's successor. Right? So God, so 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 Samuel told Saul that 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 God has selected a man after his own heart to replace him. So now Samuel goes and anoints David king. David doesn't look the part. David is a shepherd boy, right? And David was not even among his brothers when they were selecting the king. But then he was brought forth and the Lord said, that is he, anoint him. And when he was anointed, right, he was anointed to be king at that moment, but yet he was not king. He did not assume the throne because there was a king still on the throne. And the only way you could assume a throne is when the king died, right? Then someone succeeds the king. And it's usually somebody in his family that succeeds the king, right? So, so, so David's anointed. He's got a promise of God in his life, right? But here's the contrast. Saul was the people's choice. And David was a man after God's own heart, right? When Saul was anointed king, it's because the people wanted a king. It was not God's intention for them to have a king. God's intent was that he was going to rule over his own people. 
right? Like he did in the wilderness through Moses. He have a representative, but God is ruling over the people, right? But the people wanted to be like other nations. They said, no, we want a king to rule over us. And when they saw Saul, they saw that he was head and shoulders above the rest. They saw he looked apart. The they said, yes, 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 yes. We affirm that guy. That guy ought to be our king. He was the people's choice, right? But David was ruddy, young, right? Shepherd boy. He would not be anybody's choice, but he was God's choice because he was a man after God's own heart, right? So David... David is a David goes back to shepherding after being anointed king, right? Because how many of you know that when you when the call of God comes on your life, that God is going to guide you through a process before you assume what He's called you to do. There's a time of preparation, right? So he is he is believe it or not being prepared by what shepherding the sheep, but then God opens a door of opportunity for David. Because the Lord and his favor and the spirit of the Lord left Saul, he was being tormented by an evil spirit. Right? So, so his advisors came and said, we got to find somebody that can, that can play music, that can minister before him so he can find peace because he's being tormented day and night. So they remembered David, David the shepherd boy. You know, David was a worshiper. David played music and he worshiped the Lord. So they brought David into Saul's service and he began to what? Play the harp before Saul. And when David played, the peace came back to him and the evil spirits departed from him. So now David and Saul now connected in, in, in a relationship. David was serving Saul. But what an opportunity. You're anointed king and you're right in the palace where you can observe the king, you can learn from the king, you can be trained by the king, right? You could be nurtured, right? So that was David's position in the palace because God opened the door. It was part of the process. Soon after that, another opportunity because David was going in and out just to serve Saul, right? Another opportunity opened up for David. Right at the time, Israel was fighting the Philistines, right? And they were having multiple battles and they were trying to see who could defeat who. But out from the Philistines came a giant by the name of Goliath. And he said, Listen, let's stop this foolishness. You find a man that will fight me. And whoever wins our fight, the other one will serve the other one. So if I win, Goliath says, Y'all going to serve us. But if you win, then we will serve you. Let's just put an end to this foolishness. Let's just deal with it. One-on-one, -on -one, mano e mano, right? But this guy was a giant, and all the people of Israel were shaking. They were nervous. They were scared. Even the king, who won many a great battles himself, was scared of this giant. So no one would fight. And day after day, this giant was, 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 was mocking them, was taunting them, was saying, come on. Come on, bring somebody to fight me. And then one day, David's father sends him to the battle line because his brothers were in the war and, and said, bring these provisions to the brothers. Bring, bring the, these provisions to them while they're in battle. So while David was there, Goliath showed his face and began to taunt the people of God again. And Saul had already said, listen, whoever can defeat this giant, I will exempt them from taxes for life, and I will give them my daughter in marriage. So he already, like, he upped the ante. He's like, man, if somebody would step up and fight them, fight this giant, because this is getting ridiculous. So David comes. He brings the provision. He hears the giant taunting him. David stands up and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's trying to defy the armies of the Lord? You need somebody to fight him? I'll fight him. So they brought him to the king, the shepherd boy. They brought him to the king. And the king, and David says, listen, don't worry, king. Your servant will fight him. And he looked at him. And he says, don't you realize that this giant has been a man of war since his birth? 
since he was a child. This guy will, will eat you for lunch. Are you kidding me? He said, listen, man, let me tell you something, Ken. I'm a shepherd. And when I'm out in the field, a lion came to snatch my sheep. And I what took out the lion. I fought the lion. I killed the lion. A bear came to do the same. And I defeated the bear and killed the bear. What, 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 what God allowed me to do to the bear and to the lion, this Philistine will not be any different. Let me fight him. And then he agreed. And now David, equipped with a sling and five smooth stones, went and approached the giant. Right? And now this was an opportunity. Mind you, he's anointed to be king. Right? He entered the service of Saul. Right? He 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 has access to the king. But now a problem persists. Another opportunity. He came and he stepped up as a leader should in an opportunity. Right? So then he goes and defeats the giant. He slings him, he knocks him out, he takes his sword, he cuts his head off. Now they win a great victory over the Philistines. Now they're rejoicing, right? And now Saul is like, who is this dude? Mind you, he already knew. He already been acquainted with him. He's already, he's already been serving Saul. Saul's asking, who is this guy? And he said, this is the son of Jesse. And he brought him in to his full-time service. And now they're going out together to fight the wars together. So now David, because he has the favor of the Lord on him, they're winning victory after victory in their battles, right? So at that moment, David had won Saul's favor and their relationship has been solidified, right? And Saul... Saul's oldest son made a covenant of everlasting friendship with David. In everything, Saul gave David to do the hand of God was on him, and it prospered. The king requested that he eat at the table with his own sons. So he was in a close relationship with the king, right? But then eventually something happened, right? Something happened. So, they, so Saul and David went out to battle, and they won a great battle. So as tradition has, when they return home, all the women of the nation will begin to sing songs and dance and celebrate the victory as the soldiers are returning. And they start singing this song that says, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And they're celebrating. Saul said, wait a second. They're ascribing to David ten thousands, but only to me a thousand. And jealousy began to rise up in Saul. What's left? Is he going to take the kingdom from me? See, the people are loving David more than me. I'm their king. They're supposed to honor me above all, right? Offense was hitting Saul, right? So let me read it in 1 Samuel 18, verse 6 and 9. This is what happened, right? As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, the woman came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourine, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul had struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul I David from that day on. So you see what happened? A jealousy arose, right, in Saul, which resulted in an offense. He's saying, how can they honor him above me, right? And then the offense turned Saul's heart against David. Saul loved David. Saul brought him to his table. So among his family, he had a covenant relationship with his oldest son, right? He, he, he was given his daughter in marriage. David was in, in the kingdom. But jealousy turned it all around, right? Turned it all around. 
So now he he was keeping an eye on David. He said, how can I stop this guy? What? How can I destroy him? He was so angry, so jealous over David. How it quit. The offense, the beta Satan came and he got trapped in that beta Satan. All right? So... So notice something. It was God, not the devil, that placed David under the care of Saul. Why would God not only allow this, but also planned it? Why was favor dangled before David's eyes only to have it abruptly taken away? This was a prime opportunity for David to be offended, not only with Saul, but also with God. So think about that, right? David didn't do anything wrong. He didn't wrong the king at all. He was just doing, he was serving his king, right? And, and, and because of jealousy, because of insecurity, because the favor of God was upon David, but not upon Saul, jealousy ensued, right? Offense hit. And now David, who's anointed king, now is running for his life. He had to run for his life because there was one time he was playing the harp for Saul. Right? Because he kept playing for him because he kept being tormented by evil spirits. And while he was while he was playing, Saul took and threw his spear at him, hoping to kill him. But he eluded him twice and he fleed from the presence of his king. So so David must have been thinking, man, what God, what gives? How can this be happening to me? See, when offense comes, that's one of the first questions we ask. Because David's now offended, right? David is receiving an offense because he has been nothing but good to this king. He served him well. He wasn't trying to. He wasn't trying to usurp authority over him. He served him faithfully, and he said, "Why? Wow, how could he hurt me this way? How could he want to seek my life? I didn't do anything wrong. I only served him and loved him. Why? Right?" And then in the backdrop of his mind, he says, I'm anointed and God opened this great opportunity for me. And I've been in this process and all of a sudden it has been turned around and changed. What? But, 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 but not by no fault of my own. I didn't do anything to deserve this. God, what gift? And this is a prime moment where David could have been offended. Offense, the trap has been laid for David. And David is going through all of these changes in his mind. He can't believe that Saul is doing this to him, right? He can't believe that this is happening. He saw the scenario. He saw that it was going to be a smooth transition when the time came because he's going to see that God's hand is on him. And at the moment, he is going to be able to succeed him when the time comes, right? But now there is no hope for that because he's running for his life. His life is in danger. So, 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 David has, what? Does he have a right to be offended? Does he have a right to be angry? But David's posture was totally different. David's posture was totally different, right? Because as he was on the run, God gave David Two opportunities to take out his enemy. He gave him two opportunities to take out his enemy, right? One time, as they were being pursued, he came to a cave, and David was in that cave with his men. So without 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 know without knowing, David came behind them, cut off a corner of his robe without him seen and then flee from the scene. And then Saul noticed David. And David, as we shared in the first scripture in First Samuel 24, 10 to 12, right? He said this, Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, 
see the corner of your robe in my hand, right? So you see that he had an opportunity to take out his enemy and to accelerate his call, right? Because once he takes out the enemy, he can assume the, the, the throne because the people already were celebrating, right? But David, who, who, who should have had every right to avenge himself because he did nothing wrong, he said, no, I cannot touch him because he is the Lord's anointed. I cannot touch God's God. I will not stretch my hand against him. I will remain loyal to him even though he seeks my life, right? Even the soldiers around him was like, listen, man, kill him. You got him. You ain't going to get a better opportunity than that. But he wouldn't do it. The second time, as they, they were being pursued, Saul and his people fell asleep, right? And David came into the camp. And as he was asleep and his spear was right, and a, and a jug of water was right by the head of Saul. And the Lord put them to a deep sleep, so they wouldn't hear so They couldn't hear David and his men come. David takes the spear, takes the jug of water from him, right? And, and, and as he's doing that, his one of his guys said, listen, let's take him out, man. This God has given him into your hand. Listen, let me do it. I'll do it for you. Let me strike him. I only got to strike him once and I'll kill your enemy. And David's like, no, 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 no. We can't do that. We can't stretch our hand against God's anointing. And then David leaves. But David's at one uh, at the bottom of the mountain. They're on the top. And now David calls out to Saul. And Saul says, my son, what's going on, my son? He said, what's wrong with those that are? And he started to talk to the, to the soldiers. You are not able to protect your king. Do you see that I have his spear? Do you see that I have the jug of water that was by his head? Do you see that he was vulnerable and I could have taken him out? And then Saul's eyes opened he, and he said, wow, he could have taken me out, but he did it. Right? He did it. And you would think that something like that will soften his heart. Something like that will cause him to release him from the jealousy, release the jealousy he felt towards him. But David spared him those two times. He said he would not touch him. And Saul saw that, his loyalty, his love for Saul. But do you know, the offense runs so deep, right, that soon after that, he continued to pursue David. He continued to pursue David for his death, right? So this is what's happening in our day and age today. Because of offense, because of of hurts in the past, right? There is a huge void in fathers, right? Or leaders. There's a huge void because people don't trust leaders or don't trust fathers because of what happens. There is a cry in countless men and women in the body of Christ. Most of them are young and with a strong call of God on their lives. They cry out for a father, a man to disciple, love, support, and encourage them. This is why God said he will turn the hearts of the fathers or leaders to the children, people, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Malachi 4.6, right? So our nation has lost its fathers in the 40s and 50s, and today our condition is getting worse. Not unlike Saul, many leaders in our homes, corporations, and churches are more concerned with their goals than with their offspring. Because of this attitude, these leaders view God's people as resources to serve their vision instead of seeing the vision as a vehicle to serve the people. The success of the vision justifies the cost of wounded lives and shattered people. Justice, mercy, integrity, and love are compromised for success. Decisions are based on money, numbers, and results. This opens the door to treatment such as David received. After all, Saul had a kingdom to protect. This type of treatment is acceptable in the leader's mind because they are pursuing the furtherance of the gospel. So again, I ask the question, have you ever been wronged or hurt by someone in leadership? Right? Because this is an offense that most people go through. I remember my spiritual father sharing the story 
about how he was harmed and abused even, not physically, but verbally and psychologically by his pastor. He loved his pastor. He did anything for his pastor, right? But the pastor began to slander him, began to hurt him, began to take advantage of him, right? Simply because a call of God came on his life and he was starting to look to pursue it. So he started to what? Preach about him from the pulpit. He started to ask the church members to to shun him. They say rumors started to be spread about him. And he was like a man without a country because he was still in the church. So he ended up having to leave the church and leave the church. And as he's wandering and going to different churches, just trying to see where God will lead him, he ended up in another church, right? And in that church, the man of God um, stopped worship and began to prophesy over my pastor who was running. He said, somebody here is running, but God has called you. I need you to come up here now so I can pray for you. So the man of God was in hiding. So he decided to what? Not respond. He knew he was talking about him, but not respond. So again, they continue worship and they continue going on with the service. And then the man of God came back up there again. He said, listen, I can't shake this. This is strong in my spirit. He said, there's someone here that's running. He needs to come up here now. He has a tremendous call. He needs to come here right now so I can pray for him. And then he sheepishly came up to the front. And the man of God laid hands on him and prayed for him. Right? I will submit to you that the offense of that matter made it harder for him to trust this man of God that was giving him the word of it, right? And was opening the way for his destiny to be fulfilled. But, 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 but God continued to open the door for him because at that moment he had to release what he felt, how he was feeling, and respond to the word of the Lord, and he did. And that was the catalyst that launched him into ministry. And 30 years later, he's still pastoring a church. He still has made tremendous impact in the body, both locally and internationally. He is my spiritual father who raised me up from infancy. I got saved in his church 21 years ago. And he has brought me up. And through that, I am now being launched into ministry myself, right? Internationally and doing the work that I'm doing. Right? See, that's the that, that's the power of offense. He almost missed God because he was offended. He was hurt by a leader. And many of us have church hurt. And the thing is, is that his ministry, when he started his ministry, God began to send people to him that had church hurt, and he began to minister to them and restore them in the church again. And they started to believe again. They started to have the passion to serve again. They started to connect with leaders again. They learned to, they, they were able to be loyal again and able to move forward in the process, serve people well, right? They were released. He was able to, to, through the anointing, to bring healing to those group of people. There were seasoned pastors coming to him. Those that have been ministering for many years were coming to him, and he would, him and his wife were released into the ministry and then they will serve and then they will eventually start their own churches and do stuff and, and, and fulfill the destiny in the ministry in his life. So you see how powerful it is when you get a relief, but also how powerful it is when a leader or father figure hurts you. It can literally derail your destiny. And many people are struggling in the body of Christ because they have church hurt. They have leader hurt, right? They have these things that don't allow them to receive from another leader, don't allow them to trust another leader, right? And stagnates them in their walk and in their process in God. But if we look at David's life, all these things that happened was part of his process. But David being a man after his own heart, even though he had the opportunity, and in my opinion, he had the ability and the right to avenge himself because I believe God gave him those opportunities. The scripture says God put them to a deep sleep, right? But he still would not take the opportunity because he says, 
the Lord will avenge me. God will avenge me. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know what I got to go through. I don't know if I'm going to be on the run for the next 10, 20 years before it happens. But I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm not going to allow the offense to take me out of character, my offense to, to, to expose and to destroy an anointed man, God's choice. I'm not going, I don't want the kingdom that way. I want it the way God has prescribed it for me, the, the, through the process that God has given me. I could have it now, but I don't want it now. Right, that was the mentality of David because he says, if it means that I got to destroy my father, the one I love, the anointed one of God, I don't want it that way. So I'm going to trust God, the one who anointed me to bring me in in his time. That was David's posture. Where Saul's posture was like, no, I'm going to take, no one's going to take my kingdom away from me. No one's going to be greater than me. It was about self, and it was about satisfying the people. David was about what? Honoring his God. That's the contrast between the two, right? But you see that because of David's posture, David ultimately got the victory, right? David ultimately got the victory. Because what happened was that Saul was in a battle. And with his son, Jonathan, Jonathan was killed. Saul was wounded and he was taken out of the battle, but he was dying. And as he was dying, he called someone over to finish him off, right? And the person helped to kill him and Saul was dead. So he took his crown and he took, you know, he took his, you know, royal stuff and he brought it to David. Came to bring David the good news, right? And he said, David, Saul is dead. Right? And you will expect after that long journey that 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 David would rejoice at the, that news. David would be like, yes, finally. Thank you, Jesus. You finally delivered me from my enemy. But that wasn't David's response at all. He tore his clothes. And he began to mourn and lament and weep because his father had been killed. The one that was seeking his life the one that wouldn't have spared his life had he found him in a vulnerable situation, right? But he's mourning him. So 1 Samuel 26, verse 7 to 11 describes. And it says, So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there they saw... No, no, that's the wrong scripture. I'm sorry. Okay, 2 Samuel, chapter 1. And it's lengthy, so I'm going to read it, and we're going to close soon after that. So go with me to 2 Samuel. My apologies for the wrong thing. 2 Samuel, and we're going to, I'm going to read from verse 1. All right, and it says, After the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And when he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did it go? Tell me. And he answered, the people fled from the battle. And also many other people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Then David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning upon his spear. And behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. And when he looked behind them, he saw me and called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, stand beside me and kill me, for anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and killed him. 
because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the omelet that was on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. Verse 11. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Why do you come? Where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner and a Malachite. David said to him, How is it you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, Go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. So even after even after Saul's death, he, he still was honoring him. He did not rejoice over his death. He lamented and wept and mourned over the condition of the people. See, David truly had the heart of a king. Right? He truly had a he truly was a man after God's own heart. Because he did not rejoice that that that, that his enemy was defeated. He did not rejoice that God's anointed was killed. He did not rejoice in the defeat of his own people. Right? But so the man that came thinking he's bringing good news, right? And the one that assisted Saul in dying received what? Execution. Because he says, listen, you were not afraid to lift your hand to God's anointing. Right? You were not afraid. So I got to take you out. I can't have a man like you with me. Right? And that is the thing because David was honorable. Right? David didn't let the offense get the best of him. He didn't allow himself to be offended. He put he solely trusted in his God to bring him through. But his posture towards his leader never changed. Never changed. Right? So David was to assume his destiny from that point. And David became king and he served for 40 years as king. Right? So you see. Saul was destroyed because of his offense and even put his own people in harm's way because of being offended. But David was able to assume his destiny and serve God faithfully for 40 years. Why? Because he refused to be offended. And I tell you, though, as a leader, the way you treat people is the way they will end up treating others. It has a ripple effect. Right? Because hurt people hurt people. Right? This is the devastation of the offense. And this is why that is the bait of Satan. Right? Because if he can get you to an offended state. Where now you are not hearing from God. You are in your emotions. You are in your own thoughts. You are harboring ill will in your heart. And that thing becomes what? Anger. It could result in what? Murder. It could result in hurting. If I'm hurt, they're going to have to feel that same pain that I'm feeling. Right? And it causes you to destroy any relationship that's close because you're going to have in the back of your mind that this person is going to eventually hurt you. And that was the way when I first came to the, when I first came to the Lord, right? I, was, I came to the Lord very broken. I was at a point of being suicidal before God saved my life. And it's because I've been hurt so bad. And then I also did things that hurt people deeply, right? Because I got to a point that I became hardened. Right? Because I didn't want to trust anybody. I wanted people only close to them. I kept to myself. Right? I didn't want to trust anybody. And then God saved me from that broken state. Right? And as I started going to church, 
I still had that feeling. I still was in my feelings. I still was in my heart. Like I decided to detach myself from the fellowship, but go because I wanted to. I wanted to grow in God. I love the Word of God. I love the worship, right? But as soon as church was over, I would leave. I didn't want to have any kind of conversation with people. I didn't want to be involved in anything that the church was doing. I just wanted to go there, worship, get the word, and go home. and Just live my life on my terms. So, of course, when you, when you have that, you're not fully receiving what the man of God is preaching because the application is within the body. It's in the fellowship, right? Because we all we, we, we come into salvation, but we, a lot of us come in with baggage that we have not learned to let go. We have not learned how devastating it is to our walk. So that was a lonely time in my walk because I had no relationships. I was going to church. So the same Catholic church I left where, where, where I was revealed I had no relationships, I'm in a new church, born again, and I had no relationships. What's the common denominator? Me, because I've been hurt and offended so long. I felt justified by keeping people out of this. But eventually, the Lord and the persistence of his people got the better of me. Right? Where I finally said, okay, I'm going to go to your meeting. I'm going to go to this men's meeting that you're inviting me. And my, my mentality was, I'm going just to get y'all off my back so you stop inviting me. I'll go, I'll pretend, and then I'll leave. That was my mentality. But when I went there, the Spirit of God got a hold of me. And as we were sitting there, we were sharing and discussing. I already made up my mind. I'm not saying a word. And then when I started hearing the stories of these men and what these men were testifying to and the struggles they were going through, I was saying, wow, these guys are even more jacked up than I am. But they're willing to freely just share this stuff. Man, they're not afraid that they're going to put their business on the street. These people are sharing some personal stuff. And I said, wow. So then that began to give me permission. My heart softened a bit. And give me permission to start sharing stuff. And then those men started to minister and pray for me. And I started to feel a level of relief that was happening. And I started to connect with these guys. I started to, I called them my pioneers. They opened the way for me, man. And, and, and it's because of that, right? And then I ended up in a I ended up in a retreat not too long after that, and God dealt with the unforgiveness in my heart, and I was able to release and unfor and forgive those who have hurt me in my life, and and that release caused me to open up to now try to now become more part of what the church is doing, go to small groups start to serve in the church. All of these things started to happen. Not knowing that I had a call of God on my life. Before all of these things started to open up, God gave me an open vision about my call. And I ran from it. I said, no, I don't like people like that. I don't want to, you know, let me be behind the scenes. If I can help a person out without nobody knowing, I'll do that. But I don't want to be up front. I don't want to stand in the pulpit. I don't want to preach. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to be left alone. But then when God began to open things up and I began to connect, and then there he opened the door to connect me with a spiritual father when my heart was released, and I was able to connect with him in relationship, and I was able to walk with him for years. 16 years I sat under the mat. Was it always hunky-dory? Was it always good? Did we, did, we, did we always harmonize? No. There were times where, where I was offended by him, Right? But I've learned over the years to release the offense. It's something that my spiritual father told me. He says we need to keep short accounts with God and with people because it's eventually going to crush you and destroy you. Do you ever notice that when the person offends you, right, the one that offended you goes on with his life and then you're dealing with this offense? You're dealing with the pain of what he done or what you perceive them to do to you? And they're living their lives. Sometimes they don't even know that they offended you, that they did something wrong, right? Because we never went and decided to talk to you. So there was this one time with my spiritual father that, you know, as I was pursuing the call of God on my life, and I had 
communicated with him and he released me to pursue it and and but I felt like he was like backing away from me. Like he wasn't offering me the support. He wasn't counseling me. He wasn't offering me any wisdom. He wasn't even checking to see how I was doing. Like he kind of backed off completely from me. And I was just so confused and I started to get hurt inside because I'm saying, what's going on? And and even, you know, even like, like, like tried to discourage me from doing it when he gave me his blessing. So I'm 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 confused. I'm thinking something is wrong with me. What did I not hear God right? But I knew in my heart that God was calling me, so I was pursuing it. And then so I became I began to become offended at my past. Right? And I was carrying that in my heart. We ended up in a leaders retreat. And and, and one of the workshops was on forgiveness. Right? So so after they taught the workshop and the Holy Spirit is moving and dealing with us. They saying, listen, allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you. If there's anybody you need to forgive or relieve, do it. If the person is in the room, go to them and get forgiveness, right? Or forget. So once she said that, you know, the pastor's wife was leading. Once she said that, I got up and I made a beeline to my pastor was on the other side of the room. And I thought, oh, I walked over to him and I started to tell him. I was offended by him, the way he treated me, the way he left me, the way he did not counsel me. Oh, but I was trying to teach you something. I said, yeah, but, you know, at the same time, you know, I was going to you for counsel, and it seemed like you were discouraging me. You were making it hard and difficult for me for no reason, right? You didn't talk to me. You didn't do anything for me. You, you abandoned me. You made me feel like that I was wrong. And then he started to see it as I was explaining it to him. And then he apologized. And we and, and I released him. Accepted his apology. I offered him the forgiveness. I released him. He embraced and we still have a relationship. Right? Still have a relationship today. And even though like I walked away from that understanding this one thing. Right? We want our leaders to be perfect for them. Right? There's certain things that they may not have the capacity to do, but our expectation reveal reveal the 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 the, the lack of meeting an expectation is what what causes the offense. What he was doing could have been helping me, but my expectation was that he would be walking with me through this thing, and even when I went to pursue it that he would still remain in my life as a source of wisdom and counsel. But none of that happened. Right? So he so 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 even though we reconciled, that still remained my what? Expectation. So when I went off and started my ministry and stuff and I noticed that he was not really checking in with me and when I called him he never asked me about it. And I started to get offended all over again. He would come into my town to visit and I would not I would not find out about it until after he went back home and then he would never call to say, let's get together for a cup of coffee, let's talk. So I started to feel a way about that because I'm saying my expectation was that, listen, he's gonna remain in my life. So when I have a relationship, my relationship is not a relationship of convenience. It's for life. Unless the Lord moves me, it's for life. Right? So then I had to come to the realization because I started to get offended all over again. And I had to come to the conclusion that that he has brought me to the place where God has gifted him and graced him to bring me to. Now I'm connected to other leaders, taking me from here to the next level. Right? So in order for me to trust these new leaders, I gotta release my old leader for what I perceive offended because of my expectation. But I understand that now that the only expectation I have is the expectation of what God concerning my life, right? And understanding that me included, we all have flaws and we all have the ability to offend, right? But when we learn that it's not about us and it's about God, we will release that offense. Right? Because being offended is like being in prison. Nothing seems to work. 
until you deal with that hurt inside, until you allow the Lord to minister. And the way the Lord can minister to us is by doing the one thing he commands, and that is to speak. So if any of you, as I close, are dealing with that, you need to what? Ask Holy Spirit for the grace to speak. But you don't understand, Apostle Mike. You don't know what they did to me. Uh, you, and, and you may be right. But forgive anyone. Right? Because when we forgive, it's really for us to be free. Because it affects more than you know. And especially if that offense was someone that's close to you, it hurts. And especially if somebody actually wronged you, right? But you have reason to be offended, reason to be angry. What kind of witness do we have when we are when when, when we are we are living a life of being hurt and hurting others? Because that's eventually the result if we don't forgive. Hurt people hurt. And every time I get into that situation, I remember, I recall Jesus' words when he was being nailed to the cross. If anyone had a right to be offended was Jesus because he is being railroaded to a crucifixion. He didn't do anything wrong. He was perfect in all his way. He was innocent beyond belief, right? They released a murderer in, in his place and condemned him to die. Yet he embraced it because it was the will and purpose of God for him to do that. But now, as he was carrying his cross, those two plus miles to the mountain, right? They were spitting on him. They were mocking him. They were saying, oh, if you're the Christ, man, save yourselves and save us too. And blah, blah, blah. And then they brought him on. They laid him on the cross. They started to nail, drive those nails into his hands and into his feet. And he's there in excruciating pain. That moment, he had the presence of mind, Pastor Chloe, to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus restored the purity. That's what happens when you release and you forgive. You restore the purity of your heart. And because of that, you qualify to be our propitiation sin sacrifice. And then he became sin and the wrath of God poured. And now because of that, he has empowered us to do the same. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, forgive lest I so We have to understand we're not meant to be bound and caught in the trap of the end. We're meant to live free. The way to freedom is forgiveness. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. Praise God forever and ever. Pastor Clovis, good to see you, Pastor. Bishop, Mama. So I just want to open up a moment for whoever wants to share. Thank you, Apostle. Thank you, everyone. I know you were in and out, sir, but thank you for coming in and out. Um, yeah. Baby good, today, yeah. You're looking good, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's happy to see you. It's good to see you, man. I, I miss I'm you. in Tanzania. I, you're in Tanzania, that's right. You got the, 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 the conference, right? You have a conference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good for you, man. Good for you. Man, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Bishop, Mama. Um mm -hmm. so if anybody has anything they want to share, I know it's a heavy topic, but it's unnecessary something that we have to all deal with as believers, as leaders, right? Because it can impact us in so many ways. So so anyone want to take a moment? Bishop. Yeah, yeah. Bishop. Okay. Yes. Anything you want to share in this teaching before we close? Okay. Up? Thank you. 
I just started to share something to say that uh, this is a wonderful teaching. Uh, it's impactful and it's a, it's a wise teaching with wisdom. And uh, in the process of life, as we live, we go through offense truly. Uh, there's a time you ask me that if you have been offended, yes, truly, me, I, I got a time I, I got offended with my, my biological father. At the time I, I got sick and I was staying somewhere. I was staying at my grandparents' place, but he never came to visit me or to see me the time I was sick. So the time I, I, I got well in seeing him, I was a bit offended with him that he, why was he, was he not coming to see me? And why was it that he didn't even come to check on me? So it, it, it put a bit of offense in me in those different times, but I had to let it go the times I got saved and started to, to, to walk in the ways of the Lord, being a, 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 a student and learning and being taught. And then also in the process that I was now born again, as well as living, also as in the process of growing. But uh, at that time, I got a bit offended with uh, this uh, young pastor the, who was just uh, uh, shepherding us at, at, at that time, which we just moving with him, which happened at his, at his house. So we wanted to go to another place, uh, to our area, just where we had a structure where we were doing something. So it just came whilst I was working in the sun, I was uh, doing a gardening work. So he just said to me, I know, come, let's go. We are now leaving. We just want to go with you. You will not for, for follow after. Then I said, I ah, know it's fine, but me, yeah, look at me. I'm, I'm dirty, I'm all dusty, I'm not bad. Then he said, ah, no problem, let's go like that. So whilst we were moving, now we are in the car. We were three of us, him and the other guy. So him, he had bus, he sprayed some perfume on himself. Then he, as we were now driving, he's driving, we are going. Then he started to say to me, ah, but now Bishop, you are smelling sweat. But then I said, I, I'm smelling sweat because I was working the time you took me and I didn't have time to bath. And he said, ah, no, this is not right. Eh? Open the windows. Then I just kept quiet from that moment until we reached where we were going. I got out of his car and I just uh, waited a bit and dismissed myself and went home in the bus. But I managed to come back to the service and pray. So at that time, it brought offense on me. It offended me that he took me whilst I was working in the sun, knowing that I didn't bath, but he is saying I'm smelling. What type of insult does he want to prove on me? But he, I just put it to to forgive him and let him go because I just saw immaturity on him because it was on him, not on me. So I just said I can't just uh, carry hate on him and fail myself to worship God or do other things. Then I, I struggled for the bit, but I managed come out of it, the story of David when you were illustrating and showing these things where you showed it, how David was took by Saul as someone who was bad but David had no intention to, to kill Saul he humbled himself he saw Saul on his position of authority he respected the, the position of authority. He had an opportunity to kill him. He spared him. He had another opportunity. He spared him. Even when he was dead, he was still honoring him. And he never celebrated the death of Solo, and which showed the great importance.
impact of leadership, even being him as young, but he showed that as much as I can be offended, as much as I can want to hate, but I can't hate the anointed one of God, can't kill him. I just need to humble myself. So it also reflected me to those things when you were sharing. And it just twisted my mind to think about and to just share it. I don't know why I, 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 I said it, but I thought I should say it because I, as I thought of it, I was just inspired to say, speak it out. So it happened in the process of, of, of my journey, but I just want to thank God for all the points you were putting putting up. Some, I, I, I caught them, some I, I caught them, but I might have forgotten them, but I will review there are Amen. understanding and then apply and that's all I can say for today thank you well thank you Bishop thank you so much you know because it's, it's just very impactful I'm going to share this last story and then I'm going to pray um, and this is something in my own personal life and it's something that really saddens me so I may show a little emotion when I share this but um, years ago I was introduced to this um man of God who was um actually young in the faith. Older than me, but young in the faith. Right? So as he heard me preach and we started to connect in relationship, you know, we started to draw closer and I became his spiritual father and began to mentor him and nurture and train him and for a number of years. And then I eventually moved but I continued to stay in touch with him. So, so God had a tremendous call in his life, man. He was just so passionate um, about the men and being able to minister to men. So his church appointed him to be the men's leader, and he began to, to, to assume that position. But he started, you know, in the process, little by little, he will, he will be offended at his leader, his pastor, because he felt like his pastor was not involved with what he was doing, kind of left him alone. So he will come to me for wisdom and I will share with him. Then, you know, as time passed, he began to become more angry and angrier towards his pastor. And he will come and he would just, you know, say that, you know, I think my pastor's a false teacher because he's not preaching right. And I'm hearing from God. And I will caution him. I said, listen, do not, do not, say that publicly. Do not go and say that publicly. If you have a problem with the pastor, or you may have a problem with his teaching, go request a meeting sit down with him, because not everything it may be as it seems to be, you know. And, you know, he eventually met with the pastor. The pastor spoke, and it seemed to be a good conversation. But he began to continue to get more and more offended. The one time he perceived that the pastor was preaching from the pulpit directly against him. But in the process, he was going now, he started to go public with his critique, exposing his pastor for what he perceived his pastor was, and literally slandering him among, right on the church's group among the men. And of course, the word got back to him, and then, you know, so there was tension and strife. But he still allowed him to remain in the ministry through that, and I kept counseling through them. I said, listen, you can't do that. And he got to a point that he was like, listen, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to leave, right? I'm going to leave the church. I can't take that abuse anymore. I said, listen, you know, but then once I leave the church, I'm going to expose. I'm going to stand in front of the church, and I'm going to tell anybody that passes by that, that the pastor's a false prophet. He's a false teacher. He's this, he's that. I said, listen, I would not advise you. If you, if you feel like you need to leave the church, just let them know you're leaving and then go. Take your family and go somewhere else. So so he decided to leave, but he told all his guys that he was leaving and why he was leaving. So his expectation was that some of those guys was going to leave with him. They're going to see what the pastor did to them. They're going to take up his cause and do that. So what happened is a few of his guys requested meetings with the pastor to speak to him, to find out what happened, to find out his side of the story. So when they spoke to him, right, when they spoke to him, 
they, you know, he explained it to them. They saw his side of the story. They saw that nothing was really wrong. So they decided to stay, right? Nothing had been done to them. They had been treated well by the pastor. Um, they have been, you know, ministered well, preached as well, all of these different things. So they decided to stay. So he got offended at the fact that they stayed in this book. So I was talking with him on the phone, and he was telling me the story. And as I was telling him, I said, listen, you cannot have that expectation. These people don't belong to you. They belong to God, and they decided to stay with their pastor. You know? So so you don't need to break fellowship with them. You just need to release your pastor. You need to be able to release them before you move on. And he started getting angry, and he yelled at me on the phone. He started to disrespect me. So, of course, I stood my ground because immediately that offended me. I stood my ground and I said, listen, you're not going to disrespect me. Listen, we're just having a conversation. You know what I mean? I'm just pointing out what what, what, what I see here. He said, you keep going down that road, it's going to be difficult. He said, listen, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Don't call me anymore. That's it. Boom, he hung up the phone. And it's been about almost four years since I spoke to this one. He has not called me. All right? He proceeded to cut everybody out of his life, everybody that was connected to him, all the men he mentored and he was a blessing to, our prayer group, everybody that's connected to, to, to me or to his pastor, he disconnected. And then he isolated himself from everywhere. People were trying to visit him, you know, to see what's going on, to minister to him. He rejected it all. And then he started to what? Slander me publicly. He did it through a group email. He put it on Facebook that I'm a false prophet, that I'm stealing people's money. He's slandering me, right? So I had an opportunity to be offended. He said if he if he saw me, he was going to punch me in the face. So all these different things. And I'm like, my God. And I was about to type into that email to respond. And I was about to give him a lot of choice words because I was offended. But the Holy Spirit stopped me and said no. Just pray for him. Don't respond. So I obeyed God and I didn't respond. Now all these people that were with him started to connect with me on my Bible study. And they started to call me. So they saw the email. They started to call me saying, you know, can't believe he said that about you, blah, 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 blah. And they were trying, you know, just say, listen, you know, you shouldn't take that. And I said, listen, I understand the sentiment. Thank, thank you for pers- you know, for, 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 you know, like judging it according to what you know about me and not taking that to be true. But let's leave it alone. Let's, let's, let's release, let's forgive him. Let's pray. For him. And to this day, we're still praying for him. And the, the real key to know that you're no longer offended, right? And it hasn't happened yet. I'm believing God one day that this man will pick up the phone or one day I will bump into him and I will have nothing but love for him. He called me today. I will take his phone call. I will not reject him because I still love that man and I still want him to be in the will of God. I don't know what has become of him. I don't know where he's fellowshipping. I don't know if he's serving God in any capacity. Um, but I, I, I'm still believing for him to be released and to be healed of whatever offended him. And that's the power of offense. That's what offense can do to you. Cut everything off, affect every relationship you have, isolate you, put you in that place, right? And you feel justified because you feel you're right and everybody's wrong. And then you live this unhealthy life. And so what I want to what I want to close with is that let's allow the Holy Spirit to probe us. Let's allow God to deal with us with these teachings. Let's not just receive this teaching and say, oh, this is good teaching. Thank you. I was blessed. The real blessing is when God can expose and when God can deal with us and when God can heal us and deliver us from these things that's keeping us bound. We might not even think we're offended. That's part of the deception. I'm not offended. I'm just keeping it real. But you are offended. That's the thing. It's affecting your life. So allow the Lord to deal. Allow the Lord to bring you to a place of forgiveness so you can release your friends and live free. So praise God. I'm going to end right there. I've talked enough.
So I'm going to pray. Of course, we're going to pray for Mama and believe God for Mama. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Father in heaven, I just thank you. I give you praise. I thank you for this topic. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord God. Father, I open myself up. And I pray that these ministers will do the same. And I allow you to see if there's any wicked way in me. To see those hidden areas of things that I've buried even out of my memory. That's actually impacting my behavior in my life today. Whatever's in me that's tarnishing the witness of you, Lord God, deal with it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Bring us to a place of forgiveness and give us the grace to forgive. And to keep short accounts with you and with people, Lord God. Some of us may even be angry at you, Lord God, because we expected something, but you did something the total opposite, Lord God. We feel like we're being wrong by you. We feel like that your word ain't true and we're struggling to believe. Some of us may have dealt with a leader or just to receive preaching from someone else in that kind of role of authority, Lord God. And they may be bringing forth the word of life, or I can't receive it, I can't hear it, I can't process it, because I just see the leader that hurt me. And Father, deal with us, Lord God, that we may be free so we can grow and develop and pro progress in your kingdom plan. So Lord God, we thank you for today. And Father, we stand in faith and in unity. Two or three are gathered in your name, you're in the midst. So we approach you for our dear sister, who I affectionately call Mama. I thank you for her life. I thank you for her perseverance week after week, even when she's not feeling well, she's here, Lord God. So Father, we join our faith together as one, Lord God, touching and agreeing for her healing, Lord God, for you to deliver her from the affliction in her body, Lord God. We are confident that you can do it. If it's through a process, Lord God, we believe that you will see that process through completion. If it's through a miraculous means that right now you touch her and everything is turned around and the doctor will confirm it and say she is well, 100% bill of health. Father, if it continues to be progressive, that she continues to get better. <laughs> Father, we thank you for that, Lord God. But we thank you most of all, Lord God, for the grace that you place upon her life and the perseverance, Lord God, that you have given her, Lord God. We stand and rejoice knowing that you could do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think, Lord God. And we, Lord God, believe that you will complete every good work that you saw. And we ask these things in no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. All right, everyone. God bless you all. And I'll see you next week. <laughs> Pastor Clovis, I'll see you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.